So I've already conquered first year calculus in Python, and so I thought, what were the uh, next steps? Why not do second year calculus as well? Second year calculus, of course, is filled with much more complicated, but also exciting goodies like line integrals, surface integrals. You start getting into multivariable calculus, things like the chain rule with you know, functions that are functions of many variables, for example, partial derivatives, all sorts of stuff that gets quite a bit more complicated. We're gonna do everything in SymPy, where you can actually evaluate integrals and take derivatives and stuff. But oftentimes, of course, you can't actually compute the integral of things, in which case we're gonna use SciPy to evaluate things numerically. Also, big news, I don't know if you've seen the announcement, but we now have a Discord server that's live. I have a link in the description to that. Be sure to join if you wanna hang out, you know, have some fun, talk about the videos and talk about ideas in the videos as well. And also let me know about the stuff that you guys are working on because I'm curious what sort of extensions you've taken out of these videos. As always, like and subscribe and let's get started. We'll keep the packages pretty simple today. We got NumPy, SymPy, and SciPy. SymPy is going to be used for all the symbolic work or anything that can be done analytically. So this is everything that you would do in a second year calculus course. But oftentimes the problems you deal with something in that course, you know, can't be done symbolically. There's certain integrals you just can't evaluate. And that's where you would use SciPy to do it numerically. So I want to discuss that as well. Um, so if you haven't watched my Calc 1 video, be sure to give that a watch. So if you've seen my Calc 1 video, you know that uh, with SymPy you can define symbols like this, right? And I'm just creating a bunch of symbols that I'm going to use today, like X, for example, uh, U1. Don't worry about the names so much of these right now, um, but they're gonna. I'm just going to use them for various things today. So typically when you start in a second year math course, you start with vectors and geometry, and that leads into sort of 3D geometry, line integrals, path integrals, all those sorts of things. And they start with vectors and geometry. And it's a nice way to start with the SymPy here. So of course in Python, you can define uh, vectors. I like to call them either numerically. So this would be NumPy with explicit values or symbolically in SymPy uh, like this. So for example, if I look at A, it's just a, a normal NumPy array. But if I look at U, I now have these like arbitrary values here, which I can then, you know, if I go u dot subs and I, I make sure to just give maybe u1 and I put the value three in here, it will put that value into u1. So this allows me a little bit more freedom when I'm dealing with symbolic expressions versus uh, numerically with NumPy where everything is numeric right off the bat. Of course, uh, vector addition and stuff is pretty simple, like two times a plus b, that'll just do what you would expect with these two vectors. 2 times u plus v, these are also the uh, SymPy versions or the symbolic, and it will do the same sort of thing. Returning, of course, the symbolic version of the vector that you expect. Same thing, of course, with things like dot products, right? Here I take the dot product a and b, and u dot v is, of course, the formula that you're used to. And uh, cross products as well. Of course, the uh, sort of complicated cross product, uh, much more complicated than the dot product at least, and it returns a vector. Uh, also, of course, normal things like the length of a vector. If I give the vector a here, everything is like re reference to this here. It will return that length and the length of u as well, given in this explicit form. So you see the sort of analog here. And as I go through this video, you'll see why it's important in some cases to keep things uh, symbolic and why you need to do that if you're going to be evaluate, evaluating integrals and stuff. Uh, of course, other things like vector projection. This is a common formula that you might see. Um, it's the extent to which how much is a vector u in the direction of a vector v. So it's the projection. If you have a vector v pointing this way, it says if I have a vector u, how much of u is pointing in the direction of v? That formula here. Of course, uh, I just basically plug in this formula. I can do this with the numeric quantities. Or I can even do it with the symbolic quantities, getting, of course, an expression that's far more complicated looking here, but it keeps everything together. And then I can substitute whatever I want uh, into u1, u2, and u3, which are the components of the vector u, and then v1, v2, v3. Once you get like that basic understanding of vectors in second year calculus, that you then typically start talking about lines and planes in space. So a line can be parameterized like this. Uh, you have a vector r0 that's pointing somewhere. And then you have t, which is just the scalar times v. So as you, you know, scale um, t, you sort of move back and forth. If v is pointing, if r0 points like this and v points like this, then t is just a scale for v. So it'll sort of move you along a line like this. Again, 
very common stuff in uh, second year calc. So of course I can do this all symbolically like this. I define my vector R naught, which is one, one, one. That's a particular location. Uh, v is a particular, um, uh, the vector V here. And then I define my vector R, which is R naught plus T times V. And if I plug in a, a value of T, right, as I change T, I move on different parts of that line. And that's what this vector is here. Uh, the equation of a plane looks like this. You have a point P naught on a plane. So a plane is two dimensional. I tell you a point on that plane. And then, you know, if X, Y, Z is on that plane as well, uh, it satisfies this formula um, N, which is the normal vector to the plane um, dot P naught or dot, yeah, P naught minus X, Y, Z equals zero. So there are only certain values of X, Y, Z that satisfy this. So of course, what it says is that this whole thing equals zero. So there's only specific values of X, Y, Z that are allowed here. This constraint equals zero is a constraint on X, Y, Z, keeping them to a, a plane. Of course, there's examples here. Uh, find the vector parallel to the line of intersection of two planes. You have plane one, you have plane two. The, the planes are going to intersect. You can sort of imagine that geometrically. And there's going to be a line along that uh, intersection. And of course, the line along intersection is perpendicular to both normal vectors. Again, this is more specific to the type of stuff you do in second year math. But you know that the normal vector of this plane is um, minus three, six, and two. It's just related to these coefficients. Same thing with this here. It's the, the minus of uh, these here. It's perpendicular to both normal vectors. So I have my normal vectors here, which I just extract from these coefficients. And then my answer is the uh, cross product. It's gonna be perpendicular to both, right? If I have two planes intersecting and I look at the normal to each plane, that line of intersection lies on both planes, so it's perpendicular to both normal vectors. And this will get me a vector that's perpendicular to both planes. Again, if you're not used to this, just go back through the second year calculus stuff and you'll, you'll see why this makes sense. Uh, then you start to get into vector calculus itself. So you can start talking about vector derivatives. So for example, if I have a vector R here, and I'll, I'll just um, print this. So this is my vector R. Then it's really easy to take the derivative of r. You go sim dot diff r t, and I can actually take a matrix or a vector or a matrix even. It's a function of t, and it differentiates it with respect to t. Very uh, simple to do vector derivatives. Uh, this example, of course, you could do really complicated things. You might think this is simple, but this is actually kind of uh, complex here. I'm saying find the angle between the velocity and acceleration as a function of time. So remember that you have r of t. You can find v of t, which is the derivative, and a of t, which is the acceleration, the derivative. And the angle between those vectors is well defined. So I say, okay, V is the uh, derivative of R with respect to time, A is the derivative of velocity with respect to time, and theta, the angle between V and A, of course, right? Because V and A are functions of T, theta, uh, by the normal formula for the angle between two vectors, is uh, also gonna be a function of T. And you see that, you know, theta has a sort of non-trivial formula here, it's uh, complicated. And then if I want to say, well, what about at t equals six? At six seconds, what's the angle between the velocity and acceleration? I can uh, substitute, put the value six into t. So I'm going theta dot substitute t six. Now, if I don't have this here, it's just going to put in that value here. And if I go dot eval f, it will return for me a float here. It'll do all the computation. Uh, finally, I can actually plot theta as a function of time. And this is sort of where things get important because this will be used in the rest of the video. So I, I create an array of times. Of course, you've seen this in uh, uh, NumPy tutorials and stuff. If I look at TT, it's just a bunch of times here that I want to get the angle at, right? So that's TT. My angle, so I have this symbolic expression and the main theme of this video is going to be taking symbolic expressions and turning it into a Python function. I want to turn this into a function where I give it T and it tells me the angle. So for that, I use this sympy.lambdafy here. So the only argument that this takes in is t. So I give it a t here. If it took in t and y and z and all these other things, I would have to include these as like, you know, arguments here, but it only takes in one thing here. So it looks sort of weird. It's in an array. And the thing that I'm um, lambdafying is theta, which is this function here. So it's the arguments to that function are all in an array here. And then the function itself. And that gives me a function, right? So if I say like f is equal to this, I now have a Python function f. And I can say, okay, well, what's f of three? And it will return for me a value. So this works like a regular you know, Python function that you can do stuff with. So um, once I have this function here that I call, um, or you know, leaving it like this. So this is my function. 
and then into that function I pass TT so this is how I get the function everything highlighted there is the function and then TT is what I pass in here and then I can plot uh, time versus the angle and I get a plot here so again it, it's not trivial like you wouldn't know that the angle looks like this this is an example of really using Python to do neat stuff with secondary calculus I also get into vector integrals right if I have a vector r I can also take the integral of that vector so for example I have a vector r that might look like this so here's my vector r and I want to integrate this well all I have to do is simp dot integral r well if I just do this alone it's just gonna you know do something cheeky like that it's not actually gonna evaluate it I have to actually tell it to do the integral here and sometimes if it can't do the integral it will complain or it just won't load this happens to be one of the cases that you can solve this integral uh, analytically and it gives this answer here so you can do vector integrals also pretty simply in Python now, in some cases, maybe you can't solve the integral symbolically. You have to do it numerically. So that's an example here. Here I have this e to the t squared function notoriously for not having a, an integral uh, with cos cubed x. And if I try to integrate this function here, it will run for a while and it will keep running and running and running and it won't actually do anything because it turns out that there is no antiderivative to this function here. So I can wait for a long time, but unfortunately nothing is going to happen here. So it turns out for this case, we have to do it numerically. If we want to solve a definite integral with bounds, I would do it uh, uh, numerically. So I stop this because it's not able to do it symbolically. And I integrate from t equals 0 to 4. So like before, I, I define a numerical function, which uh, it's a lambda phi function. And it, it takes in t because t is the argument here. And it's uh, r that it returns. So here I have uh, our num. This is a function, right? And if I give a value, r num, and I say t is equal to 3, it returns for me a vector of values, right? Because this is a, a vector here like this. And now if I want to integrate this, right? So I simp dot lambda phi this, and I have my r numerical. Whenever you see underscore num, that means numerical in these videos. I have a numerical function here with values like that. And I use quad vec. So this is a, a special scipy integral. It's different than quad quad vec because I'm now integrating a vector function. So there's numerical ways to integrate vector functions. So I integrate our num from t equals 0 to t equals 4. And of course, if I just do this, it will give me the integral plus the error. And this just gives me the integral. And, you know, because you're integrating a vector, you get a vector, right? And that's that's sort of what's returned here. Uh, now we can start talking about things like arc length. With arc length, typically these integrals aren't solvable by hand. So you'd have to do things symbolically and then convert them to numerical functions. But there are a few cases where you can actually, uh, rare cases that can be done symbolically. So this is the formula for arc length, a common formula in uh, second year calc. It says if I have a curve in space, how long is that, right? If I bend a string like this, if I stretch it out, how long is that string really? That's the arc length of a curve. So for example, the curve zero t t squared, which is basically a parabola in one of the planes, uh, you know, you can solve the arc length here. So to do that first, I would define my vector r like this, zero t t squared, which is what I'm doing here. And then I integrate the norm of this vector. That's, that's what this in the square root here is. That's the norm, right? The absolute value of r, uh, dr dt, right? It's the norm of dr dt. So I differentiate r with respect to t and I take the norm. So doing that outside here, if I just print dr dt, that's this. So dr dt is equal to this. And then I take the norm of this vector and I get this quantity here. And then of course I integrate this from t to zero to one. Again, good to keep track of how that notation actually is there. And I get an answer that looks like this. But in most cases, it cannot be done symbolically, right? For example, this curve here, there's no symbolic, um, you know, there's no analytic solution to the integral. It has to be done numerically. So in this case, I, I once again define my vector r, like how it's specified here. I create r numerical as I did in the previous example, like before, simp dot lambda phi. The arguments to the function is t. That's the only thing this vector takes in. And the function itself is the derivative of r with respect to t and the norm of that vector just like before. And then I would use scipy's quad function to integrate our numerical from t equals zero to one. And I take just the integral, not the error on the integral, and I get this value here. So very simple. 
Um, of course, there are other relevant quantities, right? If you want to compute other vectors, there are ways of doing this before. Uh, the unit tangent vector, for example, is defined like this. Uh, you have curvature, right? And the unit vector, the normal vector to a curve n like this. These are just basically taking the vector r of t, which specifies the curve and doing different operations to it and you get things of interest. The unit tangent is like the unit vector tangent of the curve. The curvature has to do with like how curvy it is. And the unit normal points directly away. So if I have a string that's bent like this, the unit normal points outwards. And so I'll, I'll, just a quick example of finding all of these. So I'll just define some symbols here that I might use. So for example, suppose this is my r of t. In order to get t, I need the velocity vector. So for that, I get v, which looks like this. And v uh, norm, which is just the norm of the vector v, is something that looks like this. And now I can get uh, capital T vector, uh, kappa and n. Uh, and so t is v over v norm. This is just plugging in the formula. Kappa is uh, the derivative of t with respect to t, absolute value, 1 over absolute value of v. You can see I'm basically just plugging things in and then n here as well. And so then I can look, of course, at all three of these vectors. And, uh, you know, they're not, they're not simple formulas, right? I mean, they get actually pretty complicated as uh, the formula gets uh, more and more. Of course, it's not fully simplified here. And you wouldn't use those like that. It would be more for plotting. And so, for example, I can evaluate these quantities. So, for example, uh, here my path has a bunch of variables that are unknown, but I can plug in, for example, t equals 2, a equals 3, b equals 4, and c equals 5. These are specific uh, parameters here. Remember, t is where you iterate along the curve. a, b, and c are just different ways that the curve can look. And so I can substitute in these values and it will give me a float value. Same thing with n, of course, I can plug in these values too and it will give me the unit normal vector. And you could check and this has a, a unit length here. Of course, we can also make continuous plots. For example, if I wanna know the curvature of this curve as a function of time, I lambdify this function again, like I did before. It takes in the parameters t, a, b, and c, and I'm parameterizing kappa. Remember that kappa is this uh, numerical expression here, this big long thing. So it turns this into a, a regular NumPy function or a regular Python function that takes in uh, t, a, b, and c and returns a number. So that's what I'm doing with this lambdaphy here. And then I use the kappa numerical function to evaluate on this array, array of times here for a equals 1, b equals 2, and c equals 3. And I can plot the curvature as a function of time here. And there's actually like a maximum point here. So for example, this is an interesting curve because it reaches a point where there's a maximum amount of curvature and then it sort of goes down again. Uh, typically at this point in your second year calculus course, you start getting into partial derivatives and directional derivatives. So I'll define some symbols here. Of course, uh, SciPy deals with partial derivatives pretty easily, dfdx and dfdy. For example, you have a function that looks like this. You know, if you have a function f, right, that's a function of multiple variables, all you have to do is differentiate with it only with respect to x, and that's the partial derivative with respect to x here. And I can take the partial derivative with respect to y here. So this is, again, something really simple in SymPy. But, you know, there's, there's uh, these mixed derivatives as well. And to do that, if I want to take uh, dx and then, you know, two derivatives with y, I would just go first with x, then with y, then with y. And it's a theorem in calculus, of course, that for well-behaved functions that this order doesn't matter. So I can go like this. I get one answer. But if I switch the y and the x, I will get the same answer. I can move these around in any order. So it, you know, that's that's sort of the mixed uh, derivative theorem or whatever. Of course, uh, SciPy is also, or sorry, SymPy is also really good with the chain rule. So I'll define some symbols here that I'll use. Um, and uh, these here I'm going to use as functions, right? Because now we're dealing with the chain rule. So some variables are function of other variables. Uh, so I say, suppose x, y, and z are functions of t. And w is a function of x, y, and z, right? So w looks like this, and these themselves are functions of t. How do you get dw dt, right? You have to use the chain rule here. So if I, I make sure I define x up here, but then I say, okay, I explicitly say x is a function of time, y is a function of time, z is a function of time. By the way, I do this all the time in my videos about uh, classical mechanics. This comes in handy for the um, Lagrange formulation of solving physics problems. I do this in SymPy a lot. And so I can go like uh, this, and I have to redefine them because I haven't defined them yet like that. And for example, w, it says w is a function of x, y, and z, each of which are functions of t. And then SymPy will explicitly know, and if I want to differentiate w with respect to time, it will do the chain rule here. So it takes the derivative with respect to x of w times dx dt 
uh, y with w, dy dt, z w, dz dt. So it's very good at keeping track of these sorts of things. And once I have this like this, I can actually put in um, specific functions. Um, so here I put in a specific function w, which looks like this, and then I can differentiate this function with respect to t, and then substitute in uh, different values. So for example, maybe x is equal to sine t, y is cos t, z is uh, t squared. And uh, it will do these sort of things as well, pretty uh, easily. So, uh, you know, chain rule and partial derivatives, SymPy is really good at doing that sort of stuff. Uh, we can also work with gradients, right? This is again, something that's very important, especially for later on physics courses, but something that's taught in second year math. Uh, you have a function f, which is a function of x, y, and z, right? So you give me a point in space, I'll tell you f. And then there's the gradient, which points in the direction of maximum increase. So if there's temperature everywhere in space, the gradient at a specific point points where it's getting hottest the most, right? Uh, the gradient exists at every point in space. Uh, for this in SymPy, you deal with these 3D coordinate systems. So here I have my uh, coordinate system C, and I define my variable C dot X, C dot Y, and C dot Z. So I'm in a Cartesian system, right? And then uh, for gradients, right, if I have my function F here, I have X sine Y, and then I've imported the SymPy gradient function, it automatically knows to take the gradient of this, uh, knowing that these are Cartesian variables. And so gradient F looks like this. Uh, if I don't like it in this form, I can always convert it to a matrix. Uh, this looks like what I've done before. So I'm just calling gradient F.2 matrix. Make sure I pass this C, which is the coordinate system I'm, I'm in. That's something you have to do. And if I want to plug in specific values, right? You know, suppose I take this gradient and I want to make Y equal to one. I can go gradient F dot matrix, everything here, of course, and I substitute C dot Y, because that's, of course, what this is. It's this particular coordinate system, Y value, and I put in the value one here, and it will put it like this. Uh, there's also things like directional derivatives. You know, the gradient points to the maximum increase, but if I want the, the rate of change along a specific direction with a unit normal vector uh, U, right? Suppose I'm here and I want to know how is it changing when I'm going this way. Uh, it's just the gradient dot u, and of course, um, I keep my Cartesian system c here. Uh, u is uh, c dot i minus 3c dot j. So these are the, actually the unit vectors. So if I look at u here, I'm saying u looks like this. So this is the direction that I want, but then I say I make sure it's a normal vector. So I call this normalized function, and I'll make sure that the length of this vector is equal to 1, but it will keep the direction in the same direction as uh, here. So I have this vector u and the c dot i, c dot j, and c dot k are just these uh, vector hats here. And then I, if I want, for example, the directional derivative, I would just call gradient f, uh, this function I defined up here, dot u, right? That's, that's sort of what this formula is here. And it will do this. Of course, a big part of second year calculus is you have a two-dimensional function, of course, which is like a, a surface. And you want to find the extreme values on that surface. And now, of course, you know, when you get into you know, X, Y, Z, and hundreds of other variables, that's where machine learning comes into the play, right? Minimizing functions with lots of parameters is the whole point of machine learning, convolutional neural networks, LSTM networks, you know, all that is based around that. But with two values, there's a lot that you can do uh, analytically. Of course, um, that's what you would look at in a second year calculus course. And so extreme values of F of X, Y, so these are minimum or maximum points or so-called saddle points. Uh, they either occur on the boundary points of F. So for example, I create a boundary and the surface exists sort of in that boundary. Uh, they can exist on the boundary or they can exist at these so-called critical points where Fx equals Fy equals zero. Those are the only two places that you can have these minimum or maximum. So Fx is the derivative of F with respect to X. That's the notation I'm using here in Fy is the derivative of F with respect to Y. Fxx is the second derivative of F with respect to X twice. So, you know, there's certain conditions for whether something's a local maximum or a local minimum or a saddle point or the test is inconclusive. This is sort of the two dimensional thing here. So if I have this function F that looks like this and I want to find uh, what are the boundary points or the critical points. So what are the extreme values of F of X, Y? And, I, you know, I'm going to suppose that the function goes off, you know, and I'm not going to consider infinity here, uh, but I'm just going to look at the local maximum and minimum of this uh, function. So for example, uh, first of all, I need to find places where the first derivative with respect to X uh, and the first derivative with respect to Y are equal to zero. So that's what the simp.solve says. It says, look for places, uh, this equation here and this equation here. And it assumes that this equals zero 
and this equals zero. That's how you solve equations in SymPy. You rearrange your equations so everything equals zero, and you can do that for any equation. So uh, this equals zero, and this equals zero. That's SymPy.solve, and it gives me the values of x and y. So uh, one of those places is x equals one, y equals negative one, and the other is x equals zero and y equals zero. And then I need to do this test here. So I evaluate f of x, x, f x, y, y, and f x, y by doing the differentiation here with respect to x twice, here with respect to y twice, and here uh, with respect to x, and then with respect to y. So I get my values like this, and now I wanna test the first point. So for example, uh, x equals negative one and y equals negative one. Um, I substitute that into f, x, x, and that, for example, gives me negative six. And so my test here, I say f, x, x times f, y, y minus f, x, y squared. That's uh, something here. So I know that if this is uh, less than zero, then I have a saddle point, but it's greater than zero. So I know that fxx is less than zero, but this whole quantity here is greater than zero. And if I look at these conditions here, that tells me I'm at a local maximum. So uh, that's uh, how you would do a test like that. Although you learn Lagrange multipliers in second year calculus, I would argue that they're probably one of the most important things that you learn. And if you want a quick example, for example, of uh, where they're used, uh, I work for the Atlas detector at CERN, and the way that they measure uh, the energy of particles by uh, measuring you know, current and stuff is it's actually optimized using a Lagrange multiplier problem so that you get as close as possible to the true energy. And I don't want to go into that too much, but it's basically a Lagrange multiplier problem. Uh, and so it's very, these are very important, and they're actually really easy to solve in SymPy. So a Lagrange multiplier says, I want you to minimize this function, but with a constraint here. So, you know, maybe you're in space somewhere, but I'm saying only on the plane here. So I want you to minimize temperature if I know temperature everywhere, but only on this plane that goes through the space. That could be an example of this problem. So this requires solving two equations, uh, gradient of F equals lambda gradient of G. And then of course, G of X, Y, Z equals zero, which is the constraint. So my problem here is that you have a space probe shaped like a football, just imagine a metallic, you know, oval type structure sitting in space. And it has a certain shape of its uh, surface. And it sits in the sun for an hour. And uh, the temperature after sitting for an hour is given by this function here. So this temperature, of course, exists everywhere in space. But I only care about the temperature on the space probe. And I say, what's the hottest point on the space probe? And so the constraint is uh, G, which is equal to this is equal to zero. And F, which is, of course, the temperature is equal to this. So I want to find the maximum value of F, right? Or minimize or maximize, I should say here. Uh, and it's subject to uh, G, uh, this constraint here. So like before, I define my coordinate system C. And I define all the variables I need. So I need this extra variable lambda here. So lambda is uh, simp dot symbols lambda like this. I define G, which is my constraint, using uh, C dot X, C dot Y, C dot Z from this coordinate system. I also define f. So if I, uh, you know, just look at these, for example, if I look at f, it's just this expression here with x, y, and z. And uh, g, of course, is my other constraint. And so uh, that's the first three lines here. Then I define my first equation that I want to solve. And the first equation is that a gradient of f minus the lambda times the gradient of g equals zero. So this equation one here is everything there is equal to zero. Uh, and then I convert that to a matrix so that I have basically a vector equation here. So if I, you know, just look at this separately and I look at equation one, there's three equations here because it says the gradient of F, which is a vector is equal to lambda times the gradient of G. So this is a vector equation here. So three equations here uh, and equation two is the constraint on G. So there's four unknowns, X, Y, Z, and lambda, that new thing we introduce. Um, and there's for um, equations, the vector equation, which has three separate equations and the other one here. And so I have these two equations I want to solve, which is this and this, of course, my constraints. And I can solve them by using simp.solve and it will solve these two equations simultaneously. And so I get all these different uh, parameters for my solution here. And I want to know what one is the temperature the hottest at on my um, uh, ellipsoid, I guess, shape. I think I called it an ellipsoid. Yeah, an ellipsoid. And so for that, I actually use a for loop here. I know it's rare to see me use a for loop. So I loop through all these solutions and I substitute in the values of X, Y, and Z there. So I say, okay, remember this is just a list of all the different uh, extreme points here. Uh, so I wanna know which one is the temperature the hottest at. So I run this for loop 
and I look at the temperatures here, and this tells me that the first one here, so x equals minus 4 over 3, y is minus 4 over 3, z is minus 4 over 3, and the last one here, x is 4 over 3, y is negative 4 over 3, z is negative 4 over 3, are the ones that correspond to the hottest points on the ellipsoid. Uh, another thing, obviously very important in second year calculus, is multiple integrals, where you have bounds that look like this. And of course, the hardest part about this isn't so much evaluating these integrals, but looking at, you know, pictures of shapes and stuff and seeing how to do the bounds. But of course, you know, what we're looking at here is the computational part of it. So I'm just going to be focusing on evaluating these. So for example, you might have an integral that looks like this, for example, where the function you're integrating is x, dz dy dx. And for that, I define my uh, symbols here. I say f equals x. That's the f is just the integrand here. And I integrate uh, the integrand. And the way I do that is I say z goes from 3 to 4 minus x squared minus y squared. It's the first thing that's integrated. y goes from 0 to 1 minus x squared. x goes from 0 to 1. And you'll see that this is like a very sort of concise way of doing this. Uh, but most of the time, they need to be done numerically. You can't solve these integrals like in first year calculus by hand. And so for that, for example, you have an integral that looks like this. This code here will not run if I try to integrate this. There's no analytic solution to this integral. So I use scipy to do this integral. And this is a triple integral, integral here. So I define a function f, which is a function of z, y, and x. You have to do it in this order here. And uh, my function looks like this. You had to do it in this order because z is integrated first, then y, and then x. And this says that um, uh, x goes from 0 to 1, y goes from, and you give it a function here, so 0 to 1 minus x squared. z, the bounds of z depend on both x and y, and it goes from 3 to 4 minus x squared minus y squared. And I do this triple integral here, and I can get the answer to this integral like that. So if you can't do something symbolically, there's always the option to do it numerically uh, when you have these definite integrals. Uh, finally, in a typical second year uh, calculus course, you start getting into integrals and vector fields. And so you would start with something like a line integral. And a line integral looks like this. You have a vector r of t, which goes through space. It's just some, you, you know, you give me a value of t and you increment it and you go along the line. And there's a function f of x, y, z sort of in space but f of x, of course, also exists on that curve. f of x, y, z also exists on that curve as well. The line integral looks like this. So you say like ds, which is an infinitesimal element of that curve in space, multiplied by f, and you do that integral along that curve. And of course, along that curve, uh, x is equal to g of t, y is equal to h of t, and z equals k of t. And uh, ds is just equal to the absolute value of dr dt, dt, like this. That's the formula for the uh, line integral. And so I define t, of course, as my variable like this. Uh, x, y, z, and f, um, I define separately because these are actually functions. x is a function of t, y is a function of t, z is a function of t, and they're real. And I say, okay, x, y, and z are all functions of t. r is the vector r here, which is a matrix of x, y, z, and f is a function of x, y, z. So if I look at r, I get a nice thing like this, noting that x, y, and z are functions of t. And f, of course, is a function of x, which is also a function of t, y is a function of t, and z is a function of t. t sort of keeps you constrained to that curve. And my integrand, I just basically plug in this expression here. It's f times uh, the norm of this vector. And I can look at the integrand. And so it keeps it in a very gen uh, general symbolic form like this. And then maybe I have a specific path. Maybe I'm going over a helix, right? This is a helix. If it was just cos t sine t, you're just in the x, y plane. I also give this t and z, so the helix kind of wraps up like this. Uh, and I have this function f of x, y, z given like this. So this is just some, you know, it could be the temperature in space, for example. And we integrate from t equals 0 to 2 pi. Uh, this particular thing can be done numerically. So I say I'm, I have my integrand here. But integrand 1, this is a particular form of that integrand where I substitute f is equal to 2 times x times y plus square root of z. So I'm putting in that form of uh, f. Then I substitute x as cos t, y as sine t, uh, z as just t on itself. And so if I go like this, if I just show you this code here, I'm substituting into this expression all the things that I want. And if I look at integrand 1, it looks like this. But then I have to tell it to actually do it because it hasn't taken the derivatives yet. And then I call that simplify at the end to just simplify it. And of course, it simplifies because there's a sine squared plus cos squared present. And uh, so I have my integrand one here. 
And then I, it just uh, turns out to be, of course, an expression. So if I just look at integrand one, it's just an expression like this, which I integrate from t goes from zero to two pi. And that's uh, what I get that comes out here. Now, in general, of course, this can't be done symbolically because here's another path R of t. It's no longer that helix. It's something a little bit more complicated. Uh, same uh, f of x, of course, and I'm going from t equals zero to two pi. If I try to do the same thing, this won't run. So my integrand two, this is obviously a, a much more complicated looking function, which you can't integrate. So I do it numerically. I say integrand two numerical, I lambdify this expression. So integrand two looks like this. I make up uh, this lambda file like I've done throughout the video so far. The only variable it takes in is t. And I'm, the thing that I'm integrating, the function is integrand two that looks like this. Then I just use psi pi squad function. I integrate this function from zero to two pi and I get the integral value here. Uh, but there are also vector line integrals, of course. Instead of having a, a scalar function f of x, y, z, I now have capital F vector of x, y, z. And that's, uh, I take the dot product with the curve. So this is almost like work, right? If this was a force field and this was a path, that tells you the work that a field has done on a particular particle in space. And it has this form like this. So again, very analogous to before. Uh, T is just uh, its own variable and X, Y, Z and F1, F2, F3. These are functions and X, Y, and Z are functions of T. Whereas F1, F2, and F3, which are the components of F here are functions of X, Y, and Z. So I make sure X, Y, and Z are functions of T. That's true in this line integral. F1 and F2 and F3 are functions of X, Y, and Z. And then I define my vector R and my vector F. So R looks like this, X of T, Y of T, Z of T. That's just my path in space. And F is of course a function of X, Y, and Z. But in this particular case, X, Y, and Z are functions of T that lie on a particular curve like this. So everything is good. And then I can define the integrand, which looks like this, and it's kept in a sort of generic form. And then I can put in a specific value, for example, f uh, with these values here and r with this. This is a case where it can be done symbolically. So I plug in uh, f1, this is the first component of f, this is the square root of z. f2 is minus 2x, and f3 is the square root of y. So I plug in all those. Then I plug in x, y, and z themselves, which is the curve, r of t. x is uh, t, y is t squared, and z is t to the 4, and I'm integrating from 0 to 1. So I get my integrand like this, like I did before. And then I integrate this expression, t goes from zero to one. And if I look at my integrand, note that all I've done is I've taken this expression up here, which is the integrand, and I've just plugged in specific values, a specific path and a specific vector field, integrand one, and then I can integrate it using SymPy. But uh, like before, there are cases where you can't do it by hand. It can't be solved analytically, and you have to do it numerically using SymPy. So like before, I define my integrand uh, two for a different, uh, this is a slightly different vector field and a more complicated looking path. And my integrand here, this cannot be uh, integrated analytically. Uh, so what I do is I do it numerically. Again, very similar. You're starting to get the pattern here. I create a numerical function by lambdafying this expression here. The only argument it takes is, in, is t, given in an array like this. And the thing that I'm lambdafying is integrand two, uh, which is this whole expression here. And then I use scipy quad function to numerically integrate this numerical function from t goes from zero to two pi. And I take only the first element there because remember if I just do this, it gives the value and the error on the integral. And the first just gives me the integral itself. So analogous to line integrals, there are also surface integrals. Um, we did line integrals, scalar, line integrals, vector. Now we're talking about surface integrals, scalar. And as I'm sure you can guess, eventually scalar integrals, vector. Uh, scalar integrals or surface integrals, scalar look like this. So the area of a surface that's parameterized R of U V. So R is a vector. It depends on two parameters. Whenever R is only a function of two parameters, it's some sort of surface in space, right? If it's just one, if it's just T, it's a line in space. If there's two things, it's a surface in space. And so the area of this surface, right? Suppose you have some sort of surface that's bounded in some area. Uh, the area is DRDU cross DRDV. That's just a formula that's derived in most uh, calculus textbooks. Uh, the surface uh, integral, uh, you take this uh, sort of function here. And I, if there's a scalar function G, 
which depends on your location in space. Again, this could be temperature or something. Uh, is G, which is a function of R, which is a function of UV, times this uh, infinitesimal area element. So for example, if you have a metal sheet in space and there's a density of that sheet, then G would be the density and this integral would be getting the mass of that sheet. So for example, I might have a 2D parabola, R of XY is XY and then X squared plus Y squared. Uh, I can also do this in polar coordinates where R is the uh, radius, so R of rho theta. This is another way to use two variables. Uh, rho cos theta, rho sine theta, and rho squared. And I suppose that the surface density is given by g of xy is x squared plus y squared. And that means I have a parabola that looks like this, and the farther I get from the origin, the higher the value of g is. So if this were density, it means you know the farther you get up the parabola, the more dense the material is. And I want to integrate from zero to rho to one, and zero to uh, zero is less than rho is less than one, and zero is less than theta is less than two pi. So I'm just choosing a circle and that's the area of the parabola I want to integrate. So again, it's really similar to line integrals. I start by defining rho and theta. These aren't functions of anything. These are just the variables themselves. Uh, X, Y, Z, and G, these are functions. Uh, and instead of X being a function only of T this time, X is a function of rho and theta. Y is a function of rho and theta. Z is a function of rho and theta. Uh, G is a function of X, Y, and Z. So if I do all this and I print R, I get X, which is a function of rho and theta, y rho theta, z rho theta, and g is a function of x, y, and z, which themselves are functions of rho and theta. Uh, the integrand, I just plug in everything that I see here. So g times uh, you know the derivative of r with respect to rho cross r with respect to theta norm. So this whole thing here is the norm of this that you see in the integral, and I multiply it by g, and I get the following integrand here, which of course is pretty long, right? I mean, this is a cross product involved. It's not a simple thing. I can plug in the specific values that I have here now. So G is X squared plus Y squared. Uh, X is rho times sim dot cos theta. Y is rho to sim dot sine theta. Of course, this is the polar coordinates that you see here. And uh, Z is rho squared. And then I call do it and simplify. So I get my integrand that looks like this. And this can be done symbolically like before. And I get the following expression here. But as before, and I'm not going to show it every time, if it can't be done symbolically, then you need to use scipy to convert it to a numerical function, which is something we've looked at many times. Uh, finally, we can look at vector surface integrals. And like how I said that the line vector integral was like the work that you do on a particle, the surface integral, a vector surface integral, is uh, analogous to the flux, or it is the flux through a surface. If there's some surface in space and you have a vector field, such as the electric field, for example, you can calculate the flux of that vector G through the surface like this. And this is like G dot product with an infinitesimal area element. And you can integrate this over the entire surface. And so uh, same example as before, I have this 2D parabola, so uh, like this, and the vector field I'm saying is given as Y squared Z and zero. And I wanna find the flux of G through this parabola. So G is like sort of like, you could almost make, picture it like a flow of a field. It could be water flowing through a surface. It could be an electric field. It could be anything. And uh, I want to find it through the parabola for zero is less than rho is less than one and zero is less than theta is less than pi. So I'm considering only half of the parabola. So there's something flowing through this like opening of the parabola on one side. Remember zero to pi is only half the um, four quadrants. And so I define rho and theta like before. These are the independent variables. And then x, y, z are dependent on rho and theta. And g1 and g2 and g3 are the components of g. And so I define them like this. These are all functions. x, y, and z are functions of rho and theta. I make sure to define that explicitly. Uh, g1, g2, and g3, which are the components of g, are functions of x, y, and z. And then I define r and g, each of which are vectors. So I can look at g g1, g2, g3, these are the components, uh, depend on x, y, and z, and r, which is just x, y, and z itself. And then I can define the integrand. The integrand is g dot uh, dr d rho cross dr d theta. Those are the two uh, things it's parameterized by. And I got my integrand here in a sort of general form. Then I can put in my specific values that I want. So um, up here, g1 was y squared, g2 was z, and g3 was zero. So I do that like this. Again, very similar to before. I also plug in x, y, and z. I do it and then simplify. I get my specific integrand here. 
and then I integrate this uh, flux. So I make sure to integrate integrand one, theta goes from zero to pi, and rho goes from zero to one. These are the bounds, of course, that I've talked about. So this is the uh, integrand for the flux, and I can integrate this, and I get a specific value for the pl flux. <laughs> flux. And so if it can't be done symbolically like before, you have to convert it to a numpy expression or regular Python function. And then you, do, you would use scipy's quad function to integrate this. Finally, before I end off, there is some explicit scipy functionality here that's interesting for these sorts of problems. And so there's this parametric region thing, which I thought was kind of interesting. So for example, if you want to find the mass of a cylinder with radius a and height h, centered at the uh, origin with a particular density, I define all my parameters here. So a is the radius, h is the height, and then r, theta, and z are my cylindrical coordinates. And I define an actual cylinder, which is a parametric region defined by r cos theta, r sine theta, and z, where theta goes from zero to two pi, z goes from zero to h, and r goes from zero to a. This is how the parametric region thing works. So it actually contains all the information about this three-dimensional object. And then I can integrate uh, this function c dot x squared plus c dot y squared over the cylinder. So you're integrating a particular function over a region. And I can do this vector integrate function and it will actually compute for me uh, the mass of this cylinder. Now, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of this functionality because oftentimes these integrals can't be done uh, symbolically and you'd have to use a numerical function. And there was no clear way of converting this into a numerical function. But if you're interested in this sort of functionality, definitely check out this link. And as always, all this code will be included in the description below. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Also, don't forget about the Discord server. Link in the description to that as well if you want to join and have a good time. And uh, I'll see you next time.